Well, back in 2008, there was a man named Greg Howe who bought a 35-foot-tall Christmas tree. 35-foot-tall Christmas tree, which is huge. Now, you might expect, having bought a 35-foot-tall Christmas tree, he probably has a, a, a huge home to put the tree in uh, that, that, that's equal or larger than 35 foot feet, um, <laughs> but you'd be wrong. And so you think, okay, no, no worries. He'll, he'll put the tree outside and he'll decorate it and it'll look glorious and beautiful. But again, <laughs> don't be silly. That's not what, what he did. Uh, what he did was he cut the tree into three equal parts of his two-story house that was only 30 feet tall. Um, and he, uh, I think there's a picture up here we have here. Do you see this? There it is. Yes. And so on the, the first floor, you can see uh, it's about 10 feet that he put the, the whole tree, the branches are filling the, the place, and then he cut it, and then he put the second part of the tree, it's filling the, the spare bedroom, uh, and it's filling that, that room. And then on the top, it's about 15 feet up top that he, he attached to the roof of the house, um, which is just awesome, right? <laughs> um, and so at a certain angle, it almost looks like they built the home around the tree, right? You're like, that tree was always there. <laughs> they built the home around it. Um, and so just three observations real quick from this tree. Uh, one, it's huge, right? It, it is a huge, massive tree. No getting around it. Two, it's dead now. Sad, but true. Three, <laughs> outside of being a, a, a very beautiful and, and awesome kind of looking image there, this tree brings no value <laughs> to this home because it is dead. And it, it's an optical illusion of like this wow effect, but the tree is dead. And in a few weeks, the owners are going to have to take it out of the home again, right? Like this is what happens. Some of y'all bought live trees and you're regretting it at this point in the, in the time. <laughs> things are falling off. Things are dead. Uh, but that's what happens with these dead trees. They die. You've killed them. You've murdered them. Uh, <laughs> but... Sorry if that's you. <laughs> but instead of a, 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 a house that looks like it's being built around a tree, uh, I want to talk to you guys uh, about what Isaiah 11 talks about. Isaiah 11 shows us that God plants a Christmas tree in Bethlehem, and a tree that, that wasn't an optical illusion. Um, it's, it's a tree that is evidence of God's unrelenting hope unrelenting hope. And that's the title of my sermon here today. Um, unrelenting hope. And here's where we're going to go. We're going to talk about the shoot, the fruit, and the root. That's right. The shoot, the fruit, and the root. So it's going to be good. The shoot. It is not a word you probably use very often uh, unless you forgot something in the other room, right? Um, <laughs> it, but what a shoot actually is it is a young branch or stem, I think we have a picture here, um, growing out of a plant or out of a, a, a stump. A, a shoot says it will, it, it will, it will come up from the, the root here. I think we have the, the other image here. There we go. There we go. Um, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. And so for context, for God's people, they, they've always struggled to work together. There's always been infighting and chaos amidst God's people. You can look back into the book of Judges, which I think should be just rated R. Uh, there should be a restriction on who can read the book of Judges because it's pretty intense. It's pretty wild that things happen in that. Uh, but the constant refrain in the book of Judges is that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Like everyone's just doing whatever they want. Um, and another refrain that comes along throughout the book there is that there was no king in that time. And, and honestly, though, that was a good thing that there was no king because God repeatedly tells his people that a king is going to exploit you. A king is going to rob you. A king is going to put your family members on the front lines in war so that your family members get killed. And all of God's people hear this from God and say, hmm, yeah, I'll take that. 
That sounds great. Give me one of those. And so God lets them have it. God lets them have a king, and it begins with Saul. And then if we want to look at, at Jesus' family tree, we can actually see where this goes. In Matthew 1, 6, in Jesse, the father of David, who's the king after Saul, and then David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife, whole story there, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and then it goes on, and there's this civil war amongst the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom where God's people just loathe not love, loathe each other. Do we do, we do that? Do we, do we have any problems with that today? Uh, and so then jump to verse 9 uh, of this lineage, and then it goes to Uzziah, and we might remember that name as we've come into the book of Isaiah, of King Uzziah. Um, he's the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz. Does that name sound familiar? Remember, Ahaz, you're the worst. We talked about that. Okay, and then Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. This is where we're at. This is where we're at in the story of God, what God's doing here. And God has said, these kings will destroy you. These kings will take everything from you. And they said, great, let's have it. And God in his grace says, there's one king who will not. There's one king who, who will be a new David who will not exploit you, who will not destroy you, who will actually serve you, and his kingdom will reign forever and ever and ever. And so who is the shoot of Jesse? Now, you might ask, why is the Messiah here attributed to, um, to the family line of Jesse instead of David, who has been told that the king will be like David? And I think that maybe a qu an answer to that, perhaps the answer is, the point here is that it's a new David, David didn't fulfill all of his duties here. It, it, it's emphasizing it's a new beginning. It's a new version of David. A Messiah will be another David. He won't just be the offspring of David. He will be more than equal to that David. It's like a do-over. And, and then it's coming from a stump. You guys ever been on walking on paths and you've seen stumps with, with shoots and branches coming out of them? It's a wonderful, beautiful image it, 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 is, it is wild. Like, like we, we, going back to this passage here, we put chapter breaks between all of, we, put, we added chapters, we added verses, right? But this passage here feels very connected to last week's chapter in chapter 10. Because the very end of chapter 10, it ends this way. He will cut down the forest thickets with an axe. Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. And so the prophet sees the forest of Israel's pride having been thoroughly cut down and burned. And then uh, what grew up in its place was Assyria. And now Assyria's pride has been thoroughly cut down and burned. That forest has been cut down. And in this field of just devastation, of deforestation, hope comes bursting forth <laughs> out of a stump. Like it, there, there is power in seeing a stump, right? There is power in seeing this branch come out of these stumps. Like, it's cut down, but that, that little sprout is stubborn. Like, it, it will not die. It is obstinate in its, in its hope to continue to grow. It, it is defiant, refusing to die. It is unrelenting in its hope. This is why I think God chose this imagery of a tree because, I mean, did you know that most olive trees can live to 500 years old? 500 years. Some believe that, that, that some can stretch to 1,000 years. That's, that's a long time, right? These trees have been around a lot longer. They've seen more of life than we have. They know more of the world than we do. And even if a grove of trees catches fire, a good olive tree um, grower can graft an olive shoot into that stump that was just burned down and a new tree can flourish because these trees are tenacious. It is beautiful. And so I think what it's trying to tell us is that no matter the pain, no matter the ugliness, no matter what has been burned down, it's going to keep coming. This is why I think Fleming Rutledge says, Advent begins in the dark. I love that. That the season of Advent that we are in, it begins in the dark, it begins in the ugliness, it begins in a destroyed forest. Like just when you are tempted to give up on hope, that is when hope is going to spring forth. That is when God's going to do his best work. 
And so I just want to ask you this morning, where is it that you are tempted to give up on hope? What areas of life have you just said, there is no hope there? There is no hope there. Darkness seems to be all around. I can't see a path forward. Nothing will ever change. And Isaiah 11 says, a shoot from the stump of Jesse will come forth. And we know that David is dead, and so it's not referring to, J- to David, that hope isn't in him, but it's someone from David's line. And who is this? Well, let's see if we can tell who this is by this person's fruit. And so that's when we come to the fruit. Matthew seven sixteen says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I think it's really hard to, to know someone um, fully. You, it's, you sometimes maybe be surprised by someone. You're like, oh, I didn't know that about you, but... Um, you can know some things about people by their fruit. Like you can know, you can know someone by what they what they reveal to you. And so, if someone, I've seen this here before many times. Someone's after services after service, and they're sticking around and they're picking up trash and they're on their hands and knees, and that that tells you something about their character, right? It, it, you can you can know something about them. Likewise, if someone here, uh, yeah, I hear that you've been giving hundred bucks a month to a local nonprofit. I'm like, that tells me what you value. The fruit reveals your character, reveals what you care about. Also, if, if after service, uh, someone then tells you uh, about their family and all they do is, is bemoan and, and demean their spouse or their kids and then all of their friends, that tells you a little bit about them as well, right? Like you can know something about someone by their fruit. And so the fruit tells a story. Not the whole story, but it tells a story. And, and the story that's being told here about this is a promised king comes in verse 3. It says that this king will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, meaning that this king is going to judge with, with a blind justice. You ever seen Lady Justice blind? Why is that? Because she and Jesus are no longer judging based on like, oh, are they my friends or not? How can I help them advance? Have they given me a payoff? No, it's, it's blind, true justice. The scales have been weighed and have been found that way. And so then verse 4, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. I don't know about you, when I first read that, it didn't seem great for the needy. <laughs> he will judge the needy, and I think that just comes off as bad in English, and I don't think that's what it means here. Um, I think what he's trying to say is, That he's going to give justice for the needy. He's going to make things just for the needy. So that someone will finally tell the rich that their policies, which further encamp the poor in their low status, is actually crooked and evil. And so, and by the poor, it's not just materially poor, it's it's anyone who's been downtrodden, anyone who's been oppressed. And so people without power, he's going to give decisions for, which also means he's going to stand in their place. And he's going to argue on their behalf. And so it, just imagine a king coming alongside the, the most poor peasant and saying, I'm, I'm arguing your case for you. I'm standing right next to you. I'm giving you my power. Verse 5 says, righteousness will be his belt. And there's this, this picture like you have this king is like going to war. He's going to war for the most oppressed it's this beautiful image. He's the defender of the defenseless. He's the voice of the voiceless. And at this point, you might be excited. You're like, finally, we have the enlightened civil servant that we've always longed for. We finally have our political leader that, we've, that needs to come into power, that can deliver all of us. And then what happens next is that he's going to burst our imaginations of what this king can actually do. Because so far, it's like, yeah, I can, I can envision that. I can see that. But then in verse 6, it says, a wolf will live with the lamb. A leopard with a goat, the calves with the bears, the lions eating straw. And maybe the most striking is in verse 8. The infant will play near the cobra's den. And a young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. This king is not just going to make the world just a little bit better. This king is going to do, he's going to get rid of death. He's going to get rid of disease and animosity and violence and suffering. And the whole created world order is going to be restored to the way it was supposed to be. 
So there is an animosity between animals as well as between humans and animals. This king is going to bring true shalom, the Hebrew word for peace. And this peace usually we think of as it's like a cessation of war or an end to all violence and, and evil. And yes, it's that. But shalom is more than that. It's not just a stop to, to violence. It is, it's the king taking it one step further and bringing a full cosmic fixer-upper into the world of restoring something more full in its place. The king is going to right the brokenness in the created order so that animals don't fight with one another and that we don't fight with the animals. And I get it. I read this passage, and I was like, but when is all this going to happen? Like, you, <laughs> we come skeptically to this. Like, it, doesn't it just sound too good to be true? It sounds like, okay, sure, I feel that, yeah. Like, wolf with lambs, not going to happen. We, we, we know that won't happen. So maybe this passage is just hyperbolic. Maybe it's just talking about what, what, what would be cool one day. But is it, though? Am I too calloused to believe that God can do something like that? Am I too calloused to actually believe that God can really actually restore the world to the way it was supposed to be? If this is the hope for Israel, then... Why isn't it my hope here today? If they cling to these truths, why don't I cling to it? Isaiah 11 almost comes off as utopic, and I want to say that's good news. We need to hope for that. And so have I given up hope on, on this world? Have I given up hope that God can actually redeem the broken things in our world? This passage goes on to show us that there's something more wild than a wolf laying down with a lamb. In verse 12, it says, he will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Verse 13, Ephraim's jealousy will vanish. That's the northern kingdom. And Judah, the southern kingdom's enemies, will be destroyed. And Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile to Ephraim. And so what this passage is telling us is that as hard as it is to believe that a child can put their hand into a viper's den, as hard as that is to believe, what's even more wild is seeing two people groups or two people who feel like reconciliation can never happen come back together again. If Ephraim and Judah's hostilities die with this king, so can ours. This is... <laughs> This is like saying a, a, a black woman and a white supremacist who murdered her son are going to get reunited. And it almost feels offensive to even suggest that. But there's something greater with this king who will unite two sides who, who should have nothing in common, but who, who unites them because there is something greater at work here that will unite what, that, what divides them. This king, he can cast out demons, he can heal the blind, he can give justice to that son who has been murdered, and yet he can also raise the dead. He can change hearts to actually want forgiveness and want repentance when someone doesn't even want it. This king can do that. He can mend the relationships, whether that's with your mother, whether that's with your father, whether that's with your brother, your sister, your husband, or your wife, your friend, or your co-worker. This king is unrelenting. And his desire for these relationships to come together. This king is cutting down trees, but that didn't stop him because then the hope and the sprouts spring forth. There is an unrelenting, tenacious hope in this. The darkness couldn't stop this king. The grave couldn't hold him. He can work. Now, this is not, this is not saying go back to abusive relationships. Not saying that at all. Not saying that at all. There's something completely different at work there, and I think boundaries are healthy and good. What I do believe it's saying is what relationships that God has called us to have we given up on? That's, that's something completely different. Who, who do we feel like we have no hope for? Like they'll never change. That's just who they are, and we, and we just write them off. You don't have to be their change. They have their own Holy Spirit, and that's good news, right? The Holy Spirit is going to work in their lives, and so you can still pray for them. You can still hope for them that the Spirit does work in them. It doesn't have to be you that at work there, because the king that we worship is their king as well. 
And they have, to, they have to come before that king at some point in their lives. And so who is that king of glory? Well, he's not just the shoot of Jesse. He's also the root of Jesse. Now, we don't understand how that works, right? Because in verse 10, it says, In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. And the question then becomes, how can the root also be the shoot? Said another way, how can... How can the heir of the throne also be the source from where that heir comes from? How can that be the same person? And of course, you know the answer here. It's because this king is not just a king. This king is Jesus, and he is the alpha and the omega. He is the God, and he's the man. He's come together, and he does something that no one could ever expect. And just in case we missed it, Jesus spells it out for us in the last couple of verses of the Bible in Revelation 22. He says, I, Jesus, just in case you missed it, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offering. Spell it out for us. I am the root and the offering of David and the bright morning star. And so he is both the cornerstone and the capstone. He, is, he has been at work all the time. Jesus is at work all the time. Jesus is what every other king should have been. He is what David should have been. He's what all these bad kings should have been. A king that doesn't abuse and only look to themselves. It is a king that sees authority as not something to wield over, but as authority as something to serve under. That's the type of king we serve, who uses his authority to serve, to love, to care. And it's not until Christmas Day do we actually see the lengths that this king would go to to identify with the most lowly. That he would come in a manger. That when he would come, he would be a social outcast that no one would let them stay with them. He would be poor at this time. He would identify with the poor so much in this way. That's, that, that's how the lengths our God, King, Jesus, the Alpha Omega has gone to here. He is the root and the shoot of our faith. And because this king didn't stay up in his palace but stoop down and to become like us, we can now truly know this king. Verse 9 says, and this is a great verse, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Oh, <laughs> isn't that a beautiful verse? That the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The whole earth. And not just with knowledge about. For the Hebrews, knowledge was, was based on experience. And so the whole earth would be able to, to have a close and intimate relationship with him. And this Messiah will make it possible for all people to know him intimately. All people? All people? Everyone? Really? Verse 12 says, He will raise a banner for the nations and gather exiles from Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Meaning the whole earth is coming to them. <laughs> meaning God invites all nations anyone and everyone, all ethnicities, into his kingdom, which would be wild for an Israelite to hear because they were the called special people. But this is the invitation for anyone, for anyone to come to him. And that may sound too good to be true for you, but verse 16 continues to hit this. This passage is just a, is a <laughs> it's an island of hope in a sea of darkness in Isaiah, <laughs> if you've been with us for a while. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people that is left from Assyria. And there was, and there was for Israel when they came from, up from Egypt. It says God will make a way when human powers try to say you can't go. God will make a way when human powers try to prevail. He will, he will make a way for the remnant. And so maybe you think there is no way back to God for you. Maybe you think I can't return to God given what I've done. It's an act of faith just to walk into this building. God will make a way, he will make a highway for you to come back to him. Can you hope for that? Can you hope that he, that it's, as Molly said, that it almost seems too good to be true and so you're scared to even hope. That God loves you that much and he wants to bring you back in, into his realm, into his home into that, that cosmic bear hug. But maybe this is too much for you. Maybe you believe there is no hope. Maybe for you, hope has died. And I just want to say that, that may be the most dangerous place you can be in. I think the, the most dangerous place you can be is if you believe that there isn't any hope. 
Because if there isn't any hope, then of course you give up. Of course you give in. Of course you give out. Because there is no hope. And I can't tell you how dangerous the death of hope is. We see it all the time in our society. It's why people do really hurtful, painful, frustrating things. Things that just make you want to cry. Some of y'all heard news about that this week. News that just made you go, is God at work? Is he going to work? Will anything ever change? And it's when we're, we're giving up on hope is that dangerous spot where we say, I can't see it. And in my own thinking, I can't see a way out of this darkness. I can't. That's a dangerous place to be. But I want you to hear, if that's been you this week, Isaiah 11 is, that, is a message for you. Is that there is a shoot <laughs> in the darkness. When, when every tree has been burned to the ground, <laughs> there is a shoot of hope. And so do you believe Isaiah saying there is hope? There is a shoot here. Let me tell you about this unrelenting hope. This is what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 7 when he says, love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things. It is an act of love to hope all things for someone you know. Y'all, there are times when I don't believe that there's a way forward. I'm tempted to doubt. I'm tempted to, doubt. I'm tempted to believe that there's no way shalom could, could go forward. And that's in my own thinking, in my own power. But that's when we get surprised by hope. You get surprised by Isaiah 11, that hope continues to burst forth. And God, by his spirit, reminds me, and it's usually through people around you, reminding you that God is still at work because there is nothing that God can't overcome. He can make cows hang out with bears. <laughs> he tells us, like, okay. <laughs> he can make wolves hang out with lambs. Slim, he can make roosters Okay to be around one day, right? He could do all of this because he came back from the grave. There's nothing he can't overcome here. And that's at that moment when you are tempted to doubt, that's when you have to hold on to the hope of the nations. To the hope of the nations, to hold on to this Prince of Peace, this King Jesus, who is like that pesky, unrelenting root who keeps coming, who invites you to step out of your grave clothes to have hope for this world, for the poor, for nature, for animals, for, for broken relationships that they can be restored. And then God is going to invite you to be a co-heir and a co-ruler in the new heavens and the new earth. Like it is wild. <laughs> like this is a tree that you don't have to cut up and put nicely and neatly into your lives and into your home. This is a tree that you can build your home around. You can say, this is a tree that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build my life around. I'm going to literally build a house around this hope. Because there is, there, is there is an ever-growing source of resources, of love, of hope in this tree. At this Christmas, I hope that you actually hope. I hope that you can look at the darkness and still hope. And still push forward in these relationships. And still push forward in God's work here in this earth, on this earth, remaking all things new. Will you hope for that this morning? Will you look at the Christmas tree? Maybe it's a fake one. Maybe it's a live, dead one. <laughs> but remind you of the tree that God has actually put in your lives that you can hope that there is source coming from that has been in its pinnacle form of Jesus here. The King Jesus, the rightful king and rightful heir. Let me pray for us.